Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. It's hard to believe that we're already gathered together for another roundtable. Of course, we have the festival of Pesach upcoming. It was just a few weeks ago we got together to talk about Purim. And uh, right after Purim, we have the march to Passover. Of course, this is the festival that we celebrate, that we remember, that we relive the exodus from Egypt. And it's a seven-day, seven-plus-one-day festival. We have the Seder, of course, that uh, every Jewish family gets together, drinks the four cups, asks the four questions, navigates through the Haggadah. We withhold from leaven, from chametz. We eat the matzah. There is so much happening during this festival. And, of course, we thank you that you came to join us, to join the the, the Torch Roundtable to talk about this festival. Of course, this is not going to be comprehensive. We get together every festival to just chat and discuss. We don't compare notes. We just get together at the Torch Center my colleagues and I, and we talk about the festival. And it's very helpful because it gets us in the mood of the festival. We hear some ideas and we discuss them. And uh, I hope y'all are listening and enjoying. And I'm very excited for this edition of the Holiday Festival Roundtable, the Pesach Roundtable here in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. And with me, going around the table, we have the incredible Rabbi Arya Walby. He is of course, the executive director of Torch and the host of many, many different podcast shows. Go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe and like and download. Even if you don't listen, just download. That's also important. <laughs> we, we just do the cliff notes to the Rabbi Yaakov Walby podcast. And now it's, you have your own thing, and that's, that's great. And uh, next we have Rabbi Chaim Bosco. Hello. Hey, he is the, uh, he runs our young adult division. Plus, he is the rabbi and founder of the Torchwood Shul Synagogue Center Community. I don't want to define it for you, uh, but he's also the host of the incredible podcast, What is Judaism? Which extremely popular podcast. Very popular. And I got a lot of complaints that it went offline, apparently. And the reason why is because your co-host went to Israel, but now I gather he's back in Houston. So I hope to see that resume sometime soon. As a shem, back in action. And of course, we have the, I guess, the now former Torch board president. Let's let's call it different because if there's I one, thought you were a dictator for life. President if was, emeritus. If there's one t- title that's higher than being the president of the board of Torch, it's being the past president of the board of Torch. Oh, he's your past president. Well, yeah, but I, I had thought that you had secured this forever, <laughs> that you were going to write it out, but uh, you... Uh, we need fresh, fresh blood. Yeah, we need some fresh... Well, no, I think your blood is plenty fresh, but uh, we're <laughs> happy that you're still Russia? here. He's like president for life? No, I was thinking more like a Lee Kuan Yew in uh, Singapore, you know, <laughs> benevolent dictator for life, something like that, uh, the Ibn Saud family, something, you know, the... the uh, the Windsors in the <laughs> Commonwealth, but thank you for being here, of course. Well, I do want to st- stake permanent ownership to the email president at torchweb.org because it's all my intro to my podcast. So, Yes, okay, yep. so you just keep that. <laughs> it's yours. But we could just uh, we could give the, uh, the new president uh, new president at torchweb.org. Exactly. And then finally you have me, Yaakov Wolby. It's great to be here. We're talking about Pesach. It's the Pesach Roundtable in the Torch Center. Let us begin, Rabbi Arya Wolby. So it's so wonderful to talk about this incredible Yom Tov of Pesach. Pesach is the perhaps the number one observed holiday in Jewish households around the world. And there's something so incredible about Pesach that it's not a memorial day. It's not a day where we just commemorate something that happened 2,000 years ago. But at the end of Magid, the end of the longest part of the of the Seder, of the Haggadah, we say, Bechol dor v'dor, in every generation, Chayev Adam Liros says, Atzmo ki'ilu hu yatsam 
Each person must feel as if he personally had gone out of Egypt. This, I think, is the most incredible part of the entire Seder, of the entire Haggadah. It's not just an evening where we eat fine foods, bitter herbs, matzah, and drink four cups of wine. It's The idea here is so much deeper and so much greater that we need to get to a point where we feel as if it is me, Ari Iwalbi, who left Egypt on this night of Pesach. I was in Egypt and I was taken out and God split the sea for me and all of the miracles that transpired there happened to me. And that's not an easy task. I remember my grandfather telling us at the Pesach Seder that he met with Reb Chatzka Levenstein. And Reb Chatzka was a, 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 the, the, the icon of Emuna, of real, clear faith knowledge of Hashem. And he asked my grandfather, toughly, do you believe in Hashem? He says, of course. Do you believe in Yitzhiya Mitzrayim and the exodus from Egypt? He says, yes, of course. He says, you believe that there were 40, there, sorry, that there were 90 donkeys for every Jew that were filled with spoils with all of the, the gifts that the Egyptians gave them? You believe that? He says, it's hard to imagine that, but he says, well, that's what you need to believe because that's what happened. That means go get into the mindset. I mean, think of what was going on over there. Like, imagine if we had 3.2 million people, which is approximately the size of the city of Houston, all evacuating through the sea with 90 donkeys apiece filled with merchandise filled with the riches of Egypt. I mean, it's it's an unbelievable sight to behold. Can I ask, why, why is that so important? Why is it important to believe the dogma, that this thing, this event occurred? Why, why is that so significant? And I have, a, I have a question too. I have a question too on this because I heard, I never heard this before, but I heard that the, the Jews was like, it's time to go. We got to go. Can't let the, you know, the bread leaven. We got to get on, but let's just grab our 90 donkeys and all our wealth. <laughs> so it's... Well, that, that was a commandment from the Almighty. He instructed them that uh, for the for the whole night, they, they were going to door to door, picking up everyone's uh, gold and silver. Okay. Uh, just for the trip. <laughs> we'll be back in three days. Uh, yeah. So, and that was the divine mandate. So okay. they had to do it. Nice. So th- the reason why I think There's it's important... The person who wasn't looking for gold. Moshe. That's Moshe. That's right. But he got paid back with the sapphire chips from the second tablet that he chiseled out. So God says, that's for you. Everyone else got the donkeys and all that. He was collecting the acacia wood for the tabernacle, and he was collecting the bones of Joseph that was promised to be buried in Nablus, Shechem. So, but, but to Rabbi Bustle's question, why is it so important? Is it? Because over here, what does it say? It says, Chayev Adam Liros Etz Atzmo. You have to imagine yourself going out of Egypt just the way they went out. I think that this is to me, when I was going through the Haggadah this year, preparing for Pesach, this is something that stood out. That it's not just, let's tell the tale that happened to them. It, this happened to me and to you and to each and every one of us sitting around the Seder table. This happened to us. And to try to put ourselves in those shoes, to imagine the walls of water and all the fish in the water, and and just putting ourselves into that into that frame of mind, this is our miracle. Ki'ilu hu yatsim in Mitzrayim, the Haggadah says, as if you left Egypt. This is not Memorial Day. We don't commemorate an event that happened 3,300 years ago. This is an event that happens to each and every one of us at that Pesach Seder. Now, there's many commentaries that explain you can understand it as being our own little Egypt that we have, our own little exiles that we're dealing with, and you know we're all trapped in certain things. Some people are trapped with money, and some people are trapped with their materialism, and some people are trapped with, or with their careers. Fine, and this is a way to break out from our bondage, so to speak. But the whole concept of getting out of Egypt, the whole concept that we have to lirosis atzmo ki ilu hu yatsmim to me that's a big thing i don't have any any 
tips here of how to make this a real living experience for us, but to do whatever we can. They say that the, the great sages would walk around their Pesach Seder carrying sacks of heavy you know, potatoes, but to, to imagine what it was to be a slave in Egypt. And to not just in story, not just in words, but to actually act it out as if this happened to me. You know, in the Shema, it says, we have to love Hashem b'chol levavcha. And there's two bases in there, which means that we need to love Hashem with two of our hearts, the heart that has the Yetzirah in it and the heart that has the Yetzirah Tov. So I heard once that the Yetzirah uses a tool against us called fantasy. And we we imagine all kinds of things that the Yetzirah tries to trap us with and daydreaming. And so why don't we use that tool that the Yetzirah gives us, use it for Hashem? I mean, you don't have tips? We could use our imagination. I mean, we're so far from childhood that we we can't fantasize. Where did the 3.2 million person figure come from? The only number that we know is that they were around 600,000 males. There were 600,000 males between the age of 20 and 60. 60. You double that for the women. Why would I double that for the women? Because they're the same amount of women. contesting that. Okay. I'll tell you why. There are more women. I'll tell you why. Because we know that the... That the Torah tells us that the more that they were battered, the more that they were beaten, the more that they were oppressed, that resulted in the proliferation of the populace. And we know that the men worked more than the women did. Consequently, I could perhaps argue that maybe there were fewer women because the men had this unnatural growth this or the supernatural growth. Well, no, we're told that the women were oppressed as well. Maybe the men worked hard. Maybe but- they were more oppressed. We know that the Levites were the smallest, Right. Right. So there's, there's this idea, oh. why would they leave us the smallest? They were the smallest because they were not enslaved. And the more someone's enslaved, the more they they grow and proliferate. So maybe, maybe, maybe there weren't the equivalent number of women. But let's go with the number that there was. Then you add, so that's just 40 years, 20 to 60 men, women. Maybe they, they didn't live that long. One second. Since old to one, 1. 1.2 million. You add the people who are between 60 and 80 or 100 years old. You add the children or many more children under the age of 20, about the same amount. You're already at 2.4. You add the Erev Rav, who were a third of the population, the Egyptian oncomers, and you have 3.2 million. Okay. It's, that, that's I mean, the math. The, okay. the, number that, the number that I've seen written in Svarm was about 3 million. About 3 million. About okay. 3 million. Just, more so or less. 3 million... And then how many donkeys is that? If everyone has 90 donkeys. That's a lot. That's a lot of donkeys. What is that, uh, 270 million donkeys? How large is the donkey? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe we should have planned that what we're talking about over here. <laughs> Either way, it's a lot of work to prepare for Pesach. Yeah, I Actually, I had uh, many of my students over the years who told me, Rabbi, you should watch the Ten Commandments, the movie. And the truth is I ended up once watching it, I think, on VHS. For those of you who don't know VHS, go search it on Google. And uh, it was actually a little bit insightful, even though so many facts are wrong. But it was insightful to give an imagery of what it may have looked like when the sea split, when the Jews left Egypt, to just get, get an idea in our minds. So again, it's uh, I think the big task of Pesach is particularly because the mitzvah is to tell it to your children, to talk to them about the Seder, to make it real for them, to not just it's a story that happened 3,300 years ago. Yeah, the Jews were slaves and now they're free and now let's eat. Is the food out already? It really is to get into a real a real life experience, so to speak, of what it was to experience those miracles. That's it. Very nice. Thank you so much, Rabbi Wolby. Rabbi Bosco, you uh, spent many, many hours preparing for your talk over here. Well, uh, hours, maybe, maybe years. Years. <laughs> I'll share something that that I noticed once at my Seder a few years ago and it struck me and it was, it was a big insight and I'd never saw this in print anywhere. I don't know if, um, 
there's any legitimacy to this, but it seems right. And you you can decide for yourself. For, first, I had a question. We were taught by our sages, we have a tradition that only one fifth of the Jews, and that's the, that's the larger number in this debate, but at, at most one fifth of the entire Jewish population in Egypt got out and survived and crossed over the sea and, and ended up receiving the Torah. Only one fifth of the population. And then we're also taught that this, even that one fifth, all of these people were idolaters. And they were also the ones that were steeped in the, the 49th level, the maximum level of spiritual defilement before they were just completely lost. So what merit did this 20% have? Like, who was the 80%? How bad were they that they didn't get out? I mean, how, how much worse could you have gotten? So what was the determining factor? Who, what made it that this 20% got out? And even though they, they, weren't, they weren't worshiping Hashem, ostensibly, they were doing idolatry. And, so what is it? And we're also taught that there's a parallel between the exodus from Egypt and the ultimate final redemption. And it has been suggested that a similar event will occur, that only 20% of the Jewish population in the world will survive and will make it into the times of Mashiach. So what's going to be that determining factor? Well, I think that the answer is in the Haggadah. And it's, it's in the section where we read about the four sons. And one of the four sons was the wicked son. And the wicked son says, what is all of this service to you? And he excludes himself. He says to you. And he doesn't say to us. And you respond to him in kind. He says, you break his teeth, you answer harshly, and you tell him, Hashem did this for me. He took me out of Egypt. And you say it in an exclusive way, implying that had you been there, this wicked person, had you been there, you wouldn't have been saved. You wouldn't have been taken out. So this is the paradigm for the person that didn't make it. He must represent the 80% because he was the one that wouldn't have gotten out. And what made him the Russia, what made him be the one that didn't get taken out? It's because he excluded himself. He said, what is all of this service to you? And he didn't include himself. So he said, yo, you're not including yourself. Then, then you're out. And what, what comes out is that this other, this 20%, they weren't great righteous people. They were also spiritually defiled, but they had one thing going for them is that they identified as Jewish. I'm a Jew and that's it. So what, what comes out is if you're on the team, you make it. I mean, you, you might not have a great batting record, but you're on the team. And this is, uh, I, I imagine anyone listening to this podcast is already there identifies as Jewish. The fact that you're listening to this is, uh, is a pretty good indication of that. But if you have family members, if you know anyone that is teetering on this boundary, it seems like this is the answer. I mean, the, the more we love Hashem and dedicate our lives to revealing him in the world, that is our mission. But if you're looking for salvation, what's the baseline? What's going to make sure that our family gets gets to the next level just knowing that we're a Jew just having that I mean if you look at look at even Dustin and Aviram two classic evil characters in the Bible and these were Jews the, they were they were terrible to Moshe they tried to have him killed they rebelled against him later they took Korach's side in the in the great rebellion against Moses but these people made it out these two made it out, and they, in fact, were told that they even had their own private splitting of the sea for themselves. And they made it out because even though, even, no matter how terrible they were, while they were taskmasters for the Egyptians, they still had compassion on their brothers. If the Jews were going to be beaten, they took it upon themselves because at the end of the day, they were Jewish. So no matter what ideology a person has, no matter what kind of behavior they're engaged in, Pesach is a time, it's, it's the great equalizer that if you're a Jew, 
and you stand up proudly and say, I'm a Jew, you're in. That's it, final redemption. So I hope that that's a, a consolation for some of us. It, it could be at least a, a baseline goal for for our brothers and sisters that are forgetting who, who we are. Um, but you decide for yourself if that's a... Uh, that's something worth taking into account. Well, I absolutely love it. And I'll tell you, there's a famous Midrash that says what you're saying explicitly. The Midrash says, well, in what merit did the Jewish people leave? And it gives a list of things that aren't even mitzvos. It's like cultural things. They kept their Jewish name. It was Reuven and Shimon and Reuven and Shimon. They kept the Jewish garments. Uh, they, they spoke the language of the Jews. Those are not even mitzvos. I have a uh, passing Yiddish, but like we speak English. And the garments, you know, you buy it at, the uh, I don't know, J.C. Penny. You probably go to like Nordstrom Rack, I don't know. But we buy garments that are universal garments. We do mitzvot. That's what, that's what differentiates us. The Midrash says explicitly, the merit that the Jewish people had to leave was the fact that they were distinct culturally. They were culturally, culture, ah, hard word to say, culturally they were cultural. I can't say that word. Culturally. <laughs> culturally. Culturally. Okay. They were cultural. Ah, can you say it for me? Culturally. <laughs> they were that. Like Elmer Fudd. Just pick a different word. Yeah. Culturally. Culturally. Yeah. They were Jewish. And, and that is the merit that they had. And I think it's a brilliant connection between, between the Russia. That the, that the Russia says, oh, it's for you. It's not for me. That's why he wouldn't make it out because – He's divorcing himself from the public, and by doing that, you're part of the 80%, and in the 80-20 rule, you you are out. Very amazing idea, and I think it's also nice. It's also nice to know that you know we just had Purim, and you recall what you said on the Purim podcast. Not the controversial part that you said. I was what? No, but in the in the, <laughs> in the Purim podcast, you you were saying, if I'm not mistaken, what you were saying was that if I'm if I'm not misremembering. You were saying that you grew up, you didn't know anything about Purim. Hanukkah you knew about, Pesach you knew about, but right. Purim was just totally foreign. It, isn't it nice that the last bastion, so to speak, of, of, of religious observance for most Jews is everyone does a Pesach Seder. Everyone does a Pesach Seder. Everyone acknowledges this event that kind of differentiates the proto-Jews that didn't make it, the 80% that didn't make it. Ver, from the twenty percent, and 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 by coming to the seder, they're saying I'm part of that twenty percent. I'm still part of this family, and maybe someone may have strayed, and they may be very distant in their behavior. But there's something culturally, I can't, I can't say it again. Culturally, culturally connecting them to their people, to their heritage, and that they're clinging to, no matter what happens in their life. So it's, it's a nice, heartening thought that you're saying that even though there is this fear, this this uh, sort of Damocles hovering above us, saying that, hey, if Messiah comes, it's another exodus, and it's an exodus just like the first exodus, 20% maybe will make it, 80% may not. It's comforting to know that, you know, there, there are a lot, I don't, I don't know what percentage is, but there are many, many, many Jews that may be distant behaviorally, religiously, spiritually. Yeah, I'd say may, about 20%. Keep a Seder? I'm just because oh maybe, maybe I don't know but but there's definitely a lot more people that keep the seder than do many other mitzvos. Here's, and here's my dilemma. This isn't really the model of the podcast, but let me pose this question to you. Based on what we're saying right now, I'll give you an example. I was having a conversation. I was learning with a student today, and he brought up there's a a rabbi, quote unquote rabbi, of a stream of quote unquote Judaism, a Jewish woman who says. I am a rabbi of atheist Judaism. And that's that's the quote unquote religion <laughs> is atheist Judaism. And he had even sent uh, this woman an email and asked, you know, how could this be? And obviously you can't question that kind of thing. She responded uh, not very amicably. But let's take someone like that, someone that has that kind of ideology, where they're totally rejecting the principles of the faith but still can't let go of being Jewish. Like, how, like why? It sounds just, so oxymoronic, right? It's, right, exactly. It's, <laughs> atheist and Jude, Judaism. I was trying to mention. Let me know this existed. There you go. Now you know. 
well, I was trying to make sense of this because it doesn't make any sense. Like, well, how could someone arrive at this? And it must be that they're having such a conflict of identity that they identify so strongly with these modern values that are, that exist uh, very prevalently in the Western world today of, of progressivism and atheism, but still has such a strong identity of being a Jew in their heart. And you can't reconcile those two. And so it, it's not very logical. It is paradoxical and oxymoronic and atheist Judaism, but it seems to me that that's where it's coming from. So the question is, if they're still holding on to that, but they're very adamantly screaming, there is no God. What about that? Well, person? there's the famous Midrash that says, God says, if only the Jewish people abandoned me, but they kept the Torah. Because the light of the Torah will bring them back. Well, is that Torah? But it, it is. That's the Midrash. The, that's the, that's the, don't, don't look at me. I understand what you're saying. Because there, there is the Torah that's a Sama Maves, like the Talmud tells us. It could be a potion of death. But there's this idea that if there's something that's still maintaining their connection to the religion, even if they've divorced or they've severed or at least nominally rejected, repudiated, repelled their relationship with the Almighty, if there's still something that's connecting them, maybe they could still be salvaged, so to speak, to their people. But it's a it's a fantastic uh, uh, insight that you're sharing and a, an idea that I never knew that there's such a thing. But Look, yeah, it's a good point. I, yeah, I have seen the humanistic, same thing, humanistic Jews, which basically means no God. But it is logical, though, because you do see many Jews who don't believe the Torah is true, which means they believe it was written by men who lied and wrote those came from God. So therefore, the origin of the Jewish people is a group of liars, and they hold steadfast in their Judaism. This is a different but, level. This but this is believe in God. But same thing. But, the, but okay, true. But but it is logical. It's totally logical because they have a Jewish neshama, and their intellect hasn't been given the information to reconcile with. At their core, they know, and that's why it is actually a logical way of responding. So they to the won't world. be able to explain. Why they want to eat matzo ball soup and eat right. and chew matzo because there's no logic behind the matzo, right? right? <laughs> but, but they feel just compelled to do it for reasons that are just they will not, not let go. They're, they're not conscious of it. Yes. Interesting. Wow. Proud you. And I would like to add something to this idea of the eighty twenty the eighty twenty rule, as we call in business. But what I read and the way I see it is is a little different. It wasn't Hashem saying twenty percent you made the cut, eighty percent. No, it's not what happened. You know, we just had, you know, they, he took their neshamas. They died during the ninth plague. They saw all those miracles or plagues if you're an Egyptian, right? What they decided to do, the 80% was they said, look, we have all this newfound wealth. We're living in the most opulent place in the world. They chose not to go. And this is a very powerful idea. Those who left is because they chose. That's it. And what Hashem was saying is, you don't want to go? The whole reason I created the Jewish people is for this moment, is to follow me and to serve me. And so the 80% who didn't want to fulfill their destiny and just sort of sit back and live on the riches of Egypt now and prosperity, they weren't serving any purpose in his world. And I think in every moment in time, that is the deciding quality. Maybe you don't know a lot of Torah, you don't know anything about the mitzvot. Maybe you question a lot of things. But when it comes down to it, do you choose to follow Hashem? That is the deciding factor. And, and if I could give myself a little plug, uh, a couple of months or years ago, the dates blend into themselves. I spoke about this idea on a Parsha podcast. I, I know that everything I'm saying is something I heard from you in a <laughs> no, podcast. No, 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 but, it, no, but <laughs> you just reminded me, you rejiggered my mind that, you know, they, they all died in the plague of darkness, which is the ninth plague. We know that there were 10 plagues. How come the Almighty didn't allow them to see the 10th plague? Maybe they would leave then. So I speculated that maybe everyone is given the opportunity to witness the the reason for change, the 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 necessity for change, the mandate for change, the the imperative to change and to leave, 
but you're not given everything. You're going to give like nine. nine. You'll, you'll see nine. You have, you have a chance to see nine and that's it. You won't be able to see everything because there has to ultimately be some part of it that's a leap of faith. You know, once you witness that the death of the firstborn at the stroke of midnight, is ready, it's already beyond the point of free will. With nine, you could still say that up to nine, it's, it's still something which is, yeah, it's pretty remar- remarkable. It's, we would call it miraculous, but there's still wiggle room for the heretic. And what I speculated is that there has to ultimately be some part of you that you're willing to just go into the unknown. As the first tells us that you went after God, Bamidbar, in a, a barren land, Barrett's Lozaru, a place with, with no vegetation. There has to be some sort of leap that you made, and you'll be given a lot of nudges and encouragement, and you, you, you know, you'll have the clarion call to leave, but you won't have everything that you need. You, you, ultimately, at the end, you're going to have to lean into it and decide and opt to change, and if not, well, you're part of the 8 and not the 20. Well, it's like, like, any, like any relationship, which Hashem was the whole reason you orchestrate all this, which you have to trust in the other party, especially after they've proven themselves to you that they're reliable and they're dedicated to you. You have to take trust, and that's all about, that's what Amuna is. I'm going to go in this way, the way you tell me, and the things I don't understand how they're going to work out, they're going to work out. That's the whole message of Pesach, right? My, my question to what you said, Rabbi Yaakov, is the – you're saying that leap of faith, which always triggers me because the Torah actually doesn't give us a commandment to have faith. It tells us to have knowledge of Hashem. It should be a knowledge. So we're supposed to get beyond that leap. Maybe just to get us started, we take a leap. But then the more we well, investigate... Well, it's certainly rooted in logic, right? It's certainly going to be rooted in logic. But if there was no room for free will then we're in the realm of angels or animals. <laughs> Either one, pick your, pick your choice. Right. Uh, there has to be the point where the person makes a choice. And if there is a miracle that removes the capacity for free will, like happened at the stroke of midnight, well, then there's no, there's no choice. Maybe it's not a leap of logic, it's a leap of will. You know, call, call a leap of faith, not a leap of faith, a leap of will. And yes, there's enough. There's 90% of what you need to know. It's like uh, the great business person, you don't wait until it becomes, you know, widespread knowledge. If if you wait to capitalize on some sort of business idea until it's consensus, well, you lost the opportunity. So you have to know exactly when you have enough evidence to be able to make that call, make that leap, because otherwise you're not going to be able to capitalize on the opportunity. Right. It's a similar kind of thing. If you have 100% evidence and, and it's all clear and it's undeniable, there's no way to, to wiggle out of it, well, there's no more free will anymore, and it's too late by that time, that, that point. So we could call it a leap that still demands some degree of free will. Certainly it's rooted in logic, but there has to be something that the person themselves contributes towards uh, towards this exodus. Right. What an interesting so – this is nice. We get together and we don't uh, talk. We don't uh, collaborate, and all these interesting conversations uh, come up here, and it really, it really gets my blood flowing, and the the whole feeling of Pesach, and I'm starting to salivate over that matzah. Uh, not quite. Okay. We should have been recording this. <laughs> uh, that would be. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. Okay, we got it. It's it's being recorded. Yeah. You can't recapture it the second time, right? <laughs> Everything's be, being recorded by the Almighty. Oh, yes, but the uh, will it go into the podcast? <laughs> Godcast. Then. Yes, yeah, so I would like to add a little more to what Rabbi Ari will be was saying. You know, when we get to the, the Pesach Seder, you know, we're not trying to go through a checklist. There is something that we're there to accomplish. And if everyone stops and contemplates what is actually happening, what we're doing and what we're going through exactly what those Jews went through, those are things that we are all going through today. You know, the, just a, as an addendum to this whole conversation about Amuna, the Egyptians just believed that God created the world and then set it in motion and walked away. That's why the first Pharaoh that Yosef spoke to acknowledged God. When Moses came to Pharaoh, and he used 
the different name of God, the yud ke vav ke, the God that is not only created the world, but is governing all the affairs of mankind. Pharaoh could not recognize that concept. The concept hardened his heart because he wanted to be God. His ego, Pharaoh's ego, would not allow him to even comprehend that he wasn't in control of everything. And there's so many of us, and I say all of us, moments in time where we know there's a God, but do we really know this whole idea of Amuna that he is governing all of our affairs? Because if we didn't, we would never have a worry. Our only concern would be, did I daven? Did I go learn? Did I fulfill mitzvot? Did I follow halakha? Did I act of kindness? Like concerns about livelihood or health or safety, that would never cross our mind. So we're all sort of oscillating, some of us at much higher levels, but we're all oscillating in some regards. So the idea of the, the Pesach Seder is to remember that the, you know, the first thing Hashem did was demonstrate, I control all of nature. And one of the things that Rabbi Wogelinter shared with me, that Rabbi Cutler shared with him, that he heard from a Rebbe, sure it was a Chabad Rebbe, but he said something, this is, you're going to love this, Rabbi Yochal Fulbi. Because I was talking about, thinking about like the last line in the Shema. I am Hashem your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. I am Hashem your God, it is true. A little repetitive. You already said, I am Hashem your God. What Hashem is saying is, I am Hashem your God that took you out of the land of Egypt. That same Hashem that demonstrated all those miracles is your, the person reading this. I am the same Hashem to you, the one reading this. That is true. That is the mindset. I mean, we say this in the Shema twice a day. We read so much about the Exodus in, in our sitter. Hashem is wanting us to recognize this because we're all struggling with those same things, of thinking that the world around us is controlling our affairs. And you think about really where we're going from that night, where we're trying to catapult ourselves to, is the following Yom Tovim of Pesach is when we were standing at the Sea of Reeds. So the Jews had seen all this stuff, right? And now they're looking at the Sea of Reeds. They're seeing Egyptians coming at them from one angle, wild animals off this side. According to logic, there's no place to go. Now, Sun Tzu in the Art of War, what he did was he put his troops in that position and said, you're either going to die or you're going to defeat the Egyptians. Burn the boats. Right, exactly. Cross the Rubicon. God says, no, that's not what you have to do. I'll, I'll fight your battles. That's not the Jews' role. He said, you walk that way. And they said, there's water. We can't live. We, we'll drown. And what he was showing us is that when we have Amuna, there is nothing that we can stay in our way. When we march towards him following his will, nature becomes subservient to us. And that's the whole message here is we're going to get past those final two days of Pesach and guess what we're going to go back to? Our lives. All these challenges, business and relationships and all these things. And Hashem needs to once a year put us back in the same situation, get us to contemplate the fact that the Hashem that took us out of Egypt and controls all nature is your Hashem. And whatever's standing in your way, you just walk forward, walk towards Shavuos to get the Torah again. And anything that you think is standing in your way, Hashem will move out of your way. What a beautiful lesson. I, I, I nominate, I hereby nominate you back uh, to, for the role of president. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Congratulations. You earned it. <laughs> Rover Cleveland. <laughs> Non-consecutive terms. No, when, you, when you said that, it's the same. The, it's so obvious that it's like, it's ridiculously obvious that it's the same Hashem that dealt with Moshe and the Avram Avinu and all of these great, that same Hashem is, is my Hashem today. And I mean, it's like obviously true, but my perspective is so pathetic that I haven't considered that, I guess until, uh, or at least as consciously as I am right now, that was, it's eye-opening. And, and you think about like where Pesach ends up in the calendar. 
you know, like after we get past the coat, you know, it's sort of like the entire Jewish history is compressed into one year for us, right? We get past the coat and then we go into exile. First, the Greek exile, Hanukkah, where there's revealed miracles. And then we go into the Babylonian exile and we have Purim where he's wholly hidden where we are now, right? Total darkness, He's navigating everything, moving things, but we don't, we can't see it until the outcome. And then he brings us to Pesach and says, I know you're right now in the final generation, our generation. We're in the Purim era. He's behind the scenes. And then he brings us to Pesach to remember, like, I'm still there. This is the purpose of the final exile is what is going to make everything permanent for you, is that you can hold on and have a moon on me even when I'm hidden, you know, during Mount Sinai, it was all pushed down and given to the Jews. This time we are going to pull it down from the heavens because we're going to have a Muna in the whole and in, in trust in Hashem and follow him. Even when he's hidden, that's what's so powerful about the opportunity that I think the Jews in our generation have. And, and that's why I believe following your, your thought of the year being the history we know that Nisan is the month of redemption. And we were originally redeemed in Nisan, in this month, the month of Pesach. And we will be in the future redeemed, because this is when we wrap things up. And maybe it'll be this year. Hopefully it'll be this year. But one year it's going to be in Nisan that that's when we actually earn that permanence, so to say, the permanent redemption that we are all awaiting for. And hopefully we are all prepared for. I think that's what Hashem is waiting for. You know, when the, when the national revelation happened at Mount Sinai, as you taught me in the Midrash, the Jews couldn't handle it. And, it, and they kept dying. And the Shamas could not be contained in their body with that type of revelation. I think what Hashem is waiting for this time is when the revelation comes, you're going to, you're going to be able to, uh, you're going to be able to hold it. Yes. Uh, okay, so I, I prepared something here to share with y'all. I know I, I like to go at the end, or I don't know if I like to, or that's just the way it is. So uh, most of the audience already left, so it's fine. I can say controversial stuff, spicy stuff. They wait around for you. you know <laughs> oh, maybe. They fast forward to uh, this you point, are so this sweet. This is where they're starting. <laughs> you are so sweet. So this is what I'm going to share, something a little bit different, but I like it. So we know there is a concept that the first time that a word appears in the Torah, it's always symbolic of the essence of that word or that idea. It's a well-known principle that's been well-established in our literature, in our philosophy. So I noticed that the very first time where the word matzah appears, it's in a very unusual place. Of course, matzah, that's not just the mitzvah of the festival. It's what we ate in Egypt, halach ma'anya. This is the poor man's bread we ate in Egypt. It's the food that we baked on the way out of Egypt. We ate the matzah for a couple of weeks. And the name of the festival is Chag HaMatzos. It's known as the Festival of Matzah. So Matzah is Pesach. Like the, those, those are synonymous. The first time it appears is a very unusual place, chapter 19 of the book of Genesis. Of course, the book of Exodus is when the second time it appears. It appears once in the book of, book of Genesis in a very strange, unusual place. It appears in the story of Lot. Abraham, he's circumcised, and he has the three people, but they're really angels masquerading as men and they come and he makes this big lavish meal for them and they tell him well you're gonna have a uh, have a son and there's the whole laughter we know that story began precious by era and then he accompanies them and then they go to sodom and gomorrah where abraham's nephew slash brother-in-law lot is living and they're going to save him and they encounter lot and he rushes and he tries to get them to come in a way very similar to abraham to come to his house and he, he's really insistent, and they agree. And the verse tells us, chapter 19, verse 3, that, that they said, no, we'll sleep in the street. And they say, and he insists. And I said, okay, you insist enough, even the, even the angels, right? If you, if you push the envelope hard enough, even the angels will yield, will capitulate, will succumb. And it says that he made them a mishteh, vayas lahem mishteh, he made them a banquet. Umatzos afa vayuchelu. And he baked for them matzah, and they ate matzah, matzos. Plural, matzos. And Rashi says, oh, it was Pesach. And that's why he baked them matzos. Now, of course, this is fascinating because this is exactly a year before Isaac was born. And we know that Isaac was born exactly 400 years before the Exodus. 
So this is exactly 401 for our Canadian friends. 401 years. That's the big highway in Canada, in Toronto. 401 years before before the Exodus. And he's baking matzah because it's Pesach, which is a, a mind-bending idea, which we've talked about in previous podcasts, not to toot uh, my own uh, catalog. But we spoke about this in previous podcasts, that there's something about this day. This day was always Pesach. It was always Pesach. And the way you celebrate Pesach always is with matzah. And ev- everyone knew that. Abraham, well, not everyone, but Abraham knew that, certainly. Isaac knew that as well. And even, even Lot knew that. This was the day that's designated for redemption, and thus when the time came, it was brought to full expression with the actual exodus. But just a fascinating thing. Rashi tells the story of the Midrash. It was Pesach. Now, interestingly, that same day, these same angels were by Abraham, and the verse tells us that he baked them bread. So I, I saw someone speculate, well, that was before it was Pesach, and that was ready the night, it's not at Pesach. So this event that's happening night at Pesach, the Beit Matzah. Fascinating. But to me, it's interesting the very first time where matzah appears, where Pesach appears in the Torah, it's with Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah with the angels coming and they're going to destroy that city that night, that, that same night that Egypt gets destroyed and the Jewish people flee. Sodom and Gomorrah gets destroyed and Lot flees with uh, moderate success, shall we say, or checkered success you know, because his wife turns into a pillar of salt. His daughters survive. We know the story. So isn't it interesting that, like, Lot, he's the first person who baits matzah. Isn't that a surprising thing? I also noticed, you know, that after he leaves, he finds himself in a cave with his daughters, and he drinks a lot of wine in two successive nights, which does seem, maybe, reminds us sometimes of the Seder, but that's just uh, maybe incidental. We also know that, that Lot, with his daughters, becomes the forbearer of Moab, and Moab, that's where Ruth comes from. And that's very significant because Ruth is the great-grandmother of David. And David gives, gives us Solomon, which gives us Messiah. So Lot is a very significant character because he is the antecedent of Messiah. There's something about Lot that makes him worthy, at least in a small percentage, of being the forefather of, of, of David and, and Messiah. It's an astonishing thing. So Lot is, is important he, he represents something very noteworthy. Obviously, the Torah gives him a lot of attention. He's the first time we hear about matzah, and he also happens to be the first, uh, or he has to, happens to be one of the antecedents of, of Messiah. So I was trying to figure out, like, what about Lot is sim, similar as symbolic of matzah, of Pesach, and what's the redeeming qualities? And we, we kind of have to struggle to find something about him that's that's good, that's admirable. So I did think, you know, it's, Obviously, you say, well, he did kindness. Abraham did kindness. And Lot, in a very similar way, when the Lot's a little corrupted because he offers his daughters, take my daughters, do whatever you want to them. So it seems like there's a little bit, it's a little bit warped. But he does do kindness on an Abrahamic kind of level. If you compare the story of Abraham, Abraham running to them and bowing before them, washing their feet, it's very similar how those stories are structured. My grandfather, the used to say that Lot went to Sodom because he wanted to be like Abraham, to bring the sinners of Sodom back to God. Now, Abraham was very close to Sodom. He was right in the outs- outsourced of, of the cities, and that's why he had to relocate chapter 20, verse 1 of the book of Genesis. He had to relocate because now Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed, and now he has to find a new place to pitch his tent and to spread his craft of faith. So there's a lot of positive things that we could perhaps say about, about Lot. But I think, and this harkens back to what was mentioned earlier, I think that the quality of Lot, maybe the greatest quality, is that he changed. He was in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was appointed as the, as the justice. He was the leader. And then he's told it's time to leave, and he doesn't have the benefit of nine plagues. He doesn't have any of that. And the angels come, and he leaves, and he tries to get his sons in law to come, and his matadors, it doesn't work. He grabs what he can, and he hustles out of there. He abandoned his home, his home territory, the place where he had settled. He left all of his stuff behind. He left his comfort zone. He even left his married daughters. He did what we're trying to emulate, so to speak, or what we did emulate, what the 20% emulated in Egypt and what we're trying to take away from this from this festival. We know the Talmud tells us that the one of the nicknames of the Yitzhah Harad, the evil condition, is Chametz. It's the Sa'ar Shabi'isa. It's the 
leaven in the bread. And of course, it's not a coincidence. And when we spend the whole time before Pesach looking in every nook and cranny of our house for chametz, of course, that's supposed to be understood on a, on a, on a more homiletical level that within us, we also have a Yetzirah and it's squatting inside of us and we're trying to remove it. And, and, and it's, it's kind of insidious and it's widespread and covers every part of us and we have to kind of look through every nook and cranny and find out where exactly is the Yetzirah operating within us. What do we see? Jewish people they left Egypt. They hustled out of there. They kind of departed. The Ramam famously says that the Paro is also symbolic of the Yitzhara. Paro is also symbolic of the Yitzhara. They left the Yitzhara behind. 20% who were brave enough. And that's what Lot did. And you think about matzah. What's matzah? Matzah is bread, right? But it's bread missing something. It's missing there's an absence. There's not a speck of leaven. There's not a speck of Yetzirah. There's not a speck of Sodom. And that, I think, is the central element of, of Exodus and Matzah and Pesach. And that is that, you know, if, if, if it was Pesach 400 years before the Exodus, it means that there's something about this day that still exists for us today. And this is a theme that, of course, was featured many times here. There's something about this day for us right now. It's not just looking back and remembering or envisioning it's we have to leave, we have to find the area of our life, the Sodom, the, the, the leaven of the bread, the Egypt within us, and we have to abandon it, and we have to be like Lot in a little, in a little, in a small way, to become someone who to change. And I think Lot is a very good person to represent this. You know, if Even we, he remained corrupt. Exactly. I'm going to say he that. He was wicked. He, he, he was wicked. Some of us may say, you know what, Abraham, <laughs> Abraham. I can't match up to Abraham. Yes, I'm supposed to aspire to Abraham, Moshe. But it's very hard for us to say, you know, we'll be like these great titans. Lot is someone that we could all identify. He's got plenty of flaws. And we can even look at his flaws and say, you know what? Some of his flaws, thank God, I don't have. Mm -hmm. But you know what he did? Even someone like Lot, he had his own exodus. He had his own exodus from Sodom. He left. And that's why even though if we're not going to be perfect, at least we should be like stone. I'm sorry. At least we should be like, like low to leave something behind. Have Pesach matter to us. Have some lasting takeaway that there's some part of our life. Yes, it's well documented. Lot was flawed after he left. It's well established. But there was some part of Sodom that he left behind. And unlike his wife, he didn't turn around. He didn't turn around. He maintained that change. And therefore, he's going to be a worthy representative of matzah because th th this is what really we're supposed to do. And you know what? We're not perfect. None of us are like Moshe, like Abraham, not like the giants who ate the manna for 40 years. But you know who didn't eat manna? Lot didn't eat manna. But he did bake matzahs. And we may not be perfect, but there should, there should be some sort of, at least ideally, there should be some sort of change between who we are before Pesach and what we emerge from after Pesach. And you know what? Even Lot, he changed. If Lot did it, we can change as well. We should not have a half-baked matzah or a half-baked Pesach. We should allow the influence of Pesach, the transformation of Pesach, to have some sort of impact upon us, to change in some way. Leave some aspect of, of your Egypt behind, some aspect of Sodom, of the specks of, some flex of Yetzara behind and like we said, unlike Lot's wife, there should be something about it that we just don't turn back. And you know what? Lot, he's not a hero. He's got lots of problems, as his name indicates. Lots and lots and lots of problems. But he is, in fact, someone who can be the standard bearer, the torchbearer of matzah. His story can symbolize matzah for us because you know what? He changed. And if he changed maybe we could change as well. Those are my thoughts for Pesach. May we all have an incredible, uplifting, invigorating, meaningful, productive Pesach. We should clean our houses from chametz, clean our hearts from the Yitzhara, have a wonderful Seder, uh, two Seders for the, uh, those of us in the diaspora. And it should be a, a valuable experience for us. It can be, of course, as we know, my grandfather, bless me, used to always say that 
Pesach is the one night where you can have exponential growth. The rest of the year, you got to trudge along. You know, one step follows another. Small, small, small steps. Don't jump too hard. You may crash down. Pesach, those rules are discarded. One day, you could go from negative 49 to positive 49. It's the one day you could do it. But at least we should have something. We should take some little bit like Lot and leave something behind. That's my thoughts. And uh, I hope everyone has an incredible uh, Pesach. And thank you all for, for being here and for joining us for this uh, roundtable. And final thoughts, everyone here? Thank you to all of our listeners. And thank you to all of our rabbis here. Oh, thank, thank you. I, I guess, Dan, wait, Dan, you were just uh, given smicha. That's right. What's that? <laughs> I missed he it. just ordained you as a rabbi. <laughs> Great. Definitely. <laughs> So I'm to be rabbi at torchweb.org. Anyhow, my email address is <laughs> rabbiwalbyjima.com. Everyone, please share your email address. Awalby at torchweb.org. The average rabbi at torchweb.org. And still, president at torchweb.org. Some things you just don't give up. <laughs> maybe we'll get together for Lagba Omer, maybe Shavuos, if we don't get uh, canceled for this, uh, for this podcast. We'll get together again, please, that. God. I always love doing this. <laughs> Shavuot, something, please, around the future. I really enjoyed this, and thank you so much. Signing off from the Torch Center, Houston, Texas. Chag Kasher Sameach. Happy Kosher Pesach, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking Donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.